Well, hiya, BookTube. Bill Rutenberg here with the Rutenberg Library. I uh, wanted to start your week off with a uh, book haul. And um, this last weekend, uh, my wife had, um, she, she wasn't feeling real well, and I wanted her to get some rest. So I took my rambunctious four-year-old, and we just went for a day trip. And we went around and went down to St. Joe and did some shopping. And um, my, my four-year-old likes scratch art. I don't know if you know what that is. It's a, it's a black piece of paper. And when you take a little, uh, plastic pencil thing and you, and you just scratch it, different colors show up from, uh, that are, I guess, behind the scratcher stuff. <clears throat> and, uh, anyway, we went and got her a pack of scratch art. She really liked that. That was her, her big surprise. And we, um, and of course, had to do some uh, book shopping while we were out. And uh, she had picked up a book that she wanted, but uh, more importantly, I picked up some that I wanted. So I wanted to share uh, share these with you. What I picked up this last week it's it's all history related. So I hope you I hope you enjoy this. Um, before I even get started with that, I found a really cool Matchbox car. This is a '59 Dodge uh, Cornet police car. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, just a little bit different. I like old, old cars. So I picked that up, add that to the collection. Um, I also got, uh, some magazines in and I'll show you those before I get to the stack of books. Um, so the first one is the Iowa history journal. Um, we get this, at school and it ends up getting put into my uh, my mailbox and so uh, this was the new one that came out it has uh, Phoebe Sudlow Iowa's first lady who broke education gender barriers and and so this is always a nice piece of local history if you're not familiar with that if you're from Iowa or from the air or from the you know surrounding states this might be a a um, journal that you want to pick up I, I enjoy the articles, and a lot of them are written by local people, local historians, and so, yeah, it's good stuff. Um, the other magazines that I picked up, I was at um, Books Revisited, and typically when you go to Books Revisited, it, it, of course, is hooked in with the Rolling Hills Library, and what they, what they do at their bookshop is they take the the stuff that comes out of circulation from the Rolling Hills Library, and they put that up there for sale. And hardbacks are now three dollars, paperbacks are two dollars, and uh, some stuff's a dollar. Um, if they get magazines in, they tend to just give those away, and they also get donations from the public, and then they resell those. And um, as I was listening to a couple of the workers there, I was kind of browsing books and being a little bit nosy at the same time, eavesdropping a little bit. And uh, they were talking about how well the shop is doing because it had, it had just um, moved into a much, much bigger space, probably three to four times as big as what they pr uh, previously were in. And um, they were talking about how well they were doing. And um, my guess is that's why they had to increase the prices because there's just more square footage that you have to pay for when you think about the bills and stuff like that. But um, everybody loves that bookshop. They're always fair. They they do a nice job um, just talking to you, helping you try to find stuff. They'll hold reservations if you're looking for a certain book. And I just really enjoy going in there. So anyway, getting back to the magazines. Well, they had like a stack of blue and gray magazines, which is, of course, a Civil War magazine. And um, I asked him, are you giving these away also? Because I was pretty pumped. I was going to take the whole stack. And he said, no, those are, those are pretty popular. We're selling those for a dollar a piece. And I was like, oh, and I <laughs> went walking back to the stacks and he goes, you know what, you know what, uh, I tell you what, we'll sell them to you because you come in all the time and you're one of our, you know, one of our good patrons. Uh, we'll sell them to you for 50 cents a piece. And so, um, I still wanted to get the whole stack, but obviously that would be maybe a little overdoing it. So I dug through the stack and I found four of them. So I paid a couple of bucks total for these blue and gray magazines and all four of them are based on the, the Battle of Gettysburg. So this is Gettysburg Cavalry Operations from June 27th to July 3rd of 1863. And this is a, it says an anniversary uh, 
issue. It's from October of 1988. And I just love history magazines. They are some of my favorite. They've got, <coughs> excuse me, excellent photos in it. Let me see if I can find some. You know, pretty pretty long articles, pretty detailed articles. They got photos of everybody they're talking about, so you don't get lost on stuff. They've got all kinds of great battle maps when they start talking about these different battles and. Uh, it just it's very very helpful when you're flipping through these different uh civil war items so anyway it's got um that was the the cavalry operations and then i picked up gettysburg the first day so again these are all centered centered around uh gettysburg this one is november of 1987 it says it's a special issue and then I picked up the second day, Gettysburg the second day. This is March of 88. And then I picked up the third day. And this is July of 88. And so that is going to be a ton of fun for me. Um, I just, I love the articles, the photography, and then it's even fun, and, and maybe I'm just nerding out with this, but it's even fun to look at the, the advertisements in the back. People put in ads for various things, you know, books for sale. Here is Civil War Medical Surgical Bloodletting Microscopes, other pre-1880 health artifacts bought and sold, and so it's got different, you know, different uh, stores that are in the area, uh, you've got books, war games, and miniatures for the Civil War enthusiast. Send $2 for, for a catalog. The Armchair General's Mercantile. Um, so, you know, there's just all kinds of stuff. Civil War books, new and used. Um, the Carolina Traders. See, some of these I might go see if they're still in business and see if they're still fairly cheap. And, you know, just go check them out. Maybe I can find some new books on the old Civil War. So anyway, I'm going to enjoy those. I hope you guys uh, go check those out if you can find them. The Blue and Gray magazines. Those are wonderful. Um, so now you're probably waiting for the books. So let's go ahead and get into the books. So the first book in the stack is is going to be more of a world history. I, I tend to buy American history and an emphasis on the revolution in the Civil War, especially the Civil War. Uh, but I do pick up world history titles every once in a while because I do uh, teach that class at school. So this is The Rise of Napoleon Bonaparte by Robert Asprey. And uh, this is one, of, I think this was a $3 book. I think they marked it up, even though it's a paperback, they marked it up to three bucks. Um, it is, let's see, basic books. Uh, and it's from the year 2000. Um, so that's going to be fun, because like I said, I, I uh, read in my world history areas, I try to read a little bit, learn a little bit more. It's always a goal. This book has lots of different maps. I'm going to try not to tear the cover up by opening it too wide, but it's got all kinds of maps right there at the very beginning. <clears throat> Let me read the, the back cover. It says, Napoleon Bonaparte has been too often remembered as either demigod or a devil incarnate. In the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte, the first volume of a two-volume cradle-to-grave biography, Robert Asprey instead treats him as a human being. Asprey tells this fascinating, tragic tale in lush narrative detail, charting the exciting, reckless thrill ride of Napoleon's uh, verted, vertiginous, whatever, I, I'm not sure how that word's pronounced, uh, ascent to fame and the height of power. Here is Napoleon as he was, not saint, not sinner, but a man devoured, by his vision of himself, his empire, and his world. And it's got several different um, little blurbs uh, on the back from the Boston Globe and History Magazine, Book List, Kirkus Reviews. So um, anyway, I look forward to, you know, dipping into that. That should be, that should be good. I'll have to, of course, look for the other volume of this. Um, 
I was trying to remember if I have that. I got to go digging and, and see. I may have it. I don't think so, but maybe. So anyway, uh, the next one, <clears throat> the next one on the, uh, on the list, I was, uh, I saw this and I immediately thought of Peg over at the history shelf because she absolutely loves Ulysses S. Grant. And, uh, you know, she studies the civil war pretty, pretty heavily like myself. And, um, I was, I was definitely curious to know if she has read this book. So Peg, you'll have to let me know. This is Grant as Military Commander by James Marshall Cornwall. And there's that book. It's a little bit older. As you can tell, the the uh, you can usually you can usually tell if a book's older or not just by how that cover looks. And of course, um, nobody does their pages like that anymore. Or hardly anybody anyway. So this book is from let's see the Van Nostren Reinhold Company out of New York. And it is from the year, it says first published in 1970. So um, this, this book, as I was flipping through, it's got, it's, it's fairly short, just a couple hundred pages, just a little over a couple hundred pages. And it's got plenty of battle maps. It's got uh, pretty famous pictures along the way to help tell that story. Try not to tear the book up as I'm flipping through here. It's got some, uh, of course, that's not an actual picture. That's uh, from a reprint from a newspaper. But um, anyway, it's got all kinds of good stuff in here. There's my one of my favorite pictures of Grant. I love that picture. One, one day, I will get that picture, and I will blow it up and get it framed for my wall. I got to get my wife on board with that one. Uh, but that, that is the plan. But anyway, let me read your, your inside cover for this one. <clears throat> so Grant as military commander says in 1861, when the civil war began, Ulysses S. Grant was an ill paid, somewhat drunken 38 year old clerk in the township of Galena, uh, Illinois. Four years later, when he received the surrender of the Confederate forces under Robert E. Lee, at the historic courthouse of Appomattox, Grant had established himself as one of the great military commanders of all time. How such a transformation, as extraordinary as any in the annals of generalship came about, is made clear in this masterly book. The uh, stages in Grant's progress during the war are analyzed with an apparent ease and clarity, which disguise an absolute grasp of the subject. A West Point training and active service in, <coughs> excuse me, in the Mexican War meant that less than a year after joining the Union Army, Grant was already in command of the invasion of Tennessee. Thereafter, the milestones in his achievement are marked by some of the most memorable names in the war. Shiloh, Vicksburg, Chattanooga, the Wilderness, Cold Harbor, Petersburg, uh, General Sir James Marshall Cornwall's uh, approach is illuminating from several points of view. As a student of the Napoleonic campaigns and as the author of military biographies of Messina and of Napoleon himself, Sir James is able to appraise Grant's achievement not merely in the context of the Civil War, but by comparison with the acknowledged masters of strategy and tactics. As a geographer, Sir James a past president of the Royal Geographical Society, is constantly aware of the terrain over which Grant fought and, <coughs> excuse me, and so of the physical considerations by which he was bound. As a serving officer at every level in two world wars, Sir James shows an awareness not always shared by armchair strategists of what the command of troops in the presence of a resource, resourceful enemy actually entail. Again, Sir James' personal experience of military leadership enables him to analyze sympathetically Grant's relationship both with his superiors and, and with his subordinates. Finally, during his visits to the U.S., Sir James studied on the spot the battlefields with which he is concerned. Ulysses S. Grant, Sir James Marshall Cornwall believes, was one of the great military commanders of history. Clearly and persuasively, this book sets out 
the grounds on which this conviction is based. So I thought that would be, you know, it's not, not terribly long. Like I said, it's just a couple hundred pages um, of, of actual text. Let's see, what was it? Uh, 200 and, 200 and, let's see. 224 pages, so it's a pretty slim volume. Um, should get through it pretty quick. Had lots of you know pictures and maps and that kind of stuff, so that'll help speed up the process with, with reading that, but very, very excited about that. Ah, excuse me, pretty early. I'm still working on my coffee. Uh, this next book is Conceived in Liberty, Joshua Chamberlain, William Oates in the American Civil War by Mark Perry. And I'm real excited. I've got another book. I was trying to figure it out, and then I forgot to look it up. But I know I have some other books by Mark Perry. Um, I, wanna, I, I swear it's a presidential biography of some sort. But anyway, um, this book is like in awesome shape, almost brand new condition. It's from Viking Press, um, and it is from the year 1997, and was real happy to have this one wonderful photographs in the middle of you know everybody that's going to be talked about in the text of course some of those very famous photographs from the battlefields some of the generals who were there Let's see there's Pickett and Joseph Hooker so anyway, there's lots of photographs in this. It's a wonderful little piece. Um, let's see, let's read the back. Well, that's a take from the book. Uh, let's go ahead and read the front cover instead. So, <clears throat> uh, in narrating the lives of Joshua Chamberlain and William Oates, Mark Perry's Conceived in Liberty opens a fascinating window on 70 years of American history, at the center of which is the July 1863 Battle of Little Round Top. This legendary contest decided the Battle of Gettysburg and opened a door to the Northern victory in the Civil War and sent Chamberlain and Oates on paths to the national prominence. You know, I've been, I, I actually got to visit, <coughs> excuse me, I got to visit um, Gettysburg and I got to walk those very, you know, you know that, that end of the Union line. And uh, that was just absolutely fascinating. And when I was there, um, the guides had said, had made the comment that that part of the park had not really been visited all that much up until the movie Gettysburg. And then of course, everybody wanted to come see it. So at the time that I was uh, visiting Gettysburg, and this was, what, seven years ago, I think? No, eight years ago, because it was the 150th anniversary. Um, Right? Yeah. Maybe the 150th of the end of the war. Yeah, I can't remember. Anyway, it was seven, eight years ago. And um, when we were walking the, the battlefields, uh, we were on that, su that, uh, that end of the Union line, and they had actually went in, and because of the popularity of the place, they had actually went in and they had started making uh, blacktop paths all the way through there so you could actually walk to the end of the lines and it was a thrill it made my arm hair stand up knowing that I was standing in the exact spot that Joshua Chamberlain was standing in when he was giving his orders to you know hold the ground or you know make a forward charge down the hill at the was it the Alabama unit that was coming that was trying to uh, take them off the off the hill Anyway, it was thrilling, and so I'm going to love this book. Anyway, let me get back to reading the, the cover here for you. It says, drawing on a, a vast mine of documents, including letters, wartime journals, and political speeches, Perry brings their fascinating, uncannily parallel stories vivid, vividly to life. Joshua Chamberlain, the son of a Maine farmer, first made his name as an academic at uh, Bowdoin College, and then as a brilliant military commander before establishing a remarkably successful career in politics, including several terms as the governor of Maine. William Oates, an Alabama 
frontiersman of humble origins, was also a farmer's son, and his valiant service during the war became the platform upon which he built a career as a lawyer who helped revitalize the Democratic Party in the South. He was elected to both the U.S. Congress and the governorship of Alabama. Perry also traces the stories of major figures of this era, including Harriet Beecher Stowe, John Brown, Edmund Ruffin, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the amazing Fox sisters, whose ability to speak with the dead was legendary in the 1850s, Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant. They are also the prism through which uh, Perry chronicles the forces affecting North and South in the 19th century America. He explores how the conflicting forces of westward expansion, religious revi uh, revivalism, the failing cotton economy in the South, and the abolitionist movement in the North combined to compel or propel the nation toward the Civil War. Conceived in Liberty describes its major battles in heart-stopping and hair-raising detail, but also offers a compelling, often horrifying, account of daily life during the long conflict. In the post-war uh, years, Chamberlain and Oates would find themselves playing major roles in America's destiny, reconstruction policy, the party system, and not least of all, race relations. Chamberlain and Oates stand as forceful symbols of how the nation came to blows, as well as how the nation moved to redefine itself, and in President Abraham Lincoln's words, bind up the wounds of war. Their story, as eloquently and dramatically told in the pages of Conceived in Liberty, creates a, a portrait of American possibility in a tumultuous century. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. So, really looking forward to that. It's, I saw that, and I thought, that looks really good. And I saw it last time I was there also, uh, but I didn't pick it up. But this time, I was like, nope, I'm not going to let it go. You want to know why, BookTube? Because here's the reason I was not going to let that one go for another, you know, wait, waiting until next time. Because when I went to the Jesse James um, uh, Outland Mall to get a book. I had a particular book in mind, and this one was was about William Lloyd Garrison, because I'm doing a buddy read about Frederick Douglass and his life, and he keeps talking about the relationship. The author keeps talking about the relationship between Douglass and between um, William Lloyd Garrison, and I thought, you know what? That book's been sitting there for a long, long time. I'm going to go get it, because I picked it up, put it down, picked it up, put it down, and I've done that I don't know how many times. So we, my daughter and I, when we went, we actually, that was the book that I had in mind that I was going to buy and waited too long. It was gone. So when I saw that one, I decided I probably be better just pick it up and buy it. So yep, added that one to the collection. So um, the next book that I picked up was Trial by Fire, A People's History of the Civil War and Reconstruction by Paige Smith. And this is volume five in that series. And of course, like I said, it's Civil War Reconstruction, so right in my wheelhouse. Um, there's a picture of the author. This was, I believe, an eight-volume set. I looked it up online. <coughs> Just how much does it cost to pick these up? And I saw on Amazon, it's like 175 bucks for the, for the entire set. And I was like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to pay that. But I'm going to try to keep an eye out and see if I can find some more of these. Uh, so again, this is volume five, but this is from McGraw Hill Book Company out of New York. And it's from, this, this one was printed in 1982, it looks like. And I saw a couple different versions of this. Um, they all had, one version had all the eight volumes in this gold color, and another version had white, had a white uh, cover to them. I don't really care which, which uh, edition I get. I just got to try to find the rest of those to complete it. Um, it's the problem with being a completist. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, the next book that I picked up, was The Grand Idea, George Washington's Potomac and the Race to the West. And I've been reading a little bit about this in the Thomas Jefferson biography that I'm reading, that I'm buddy reading, and it was it was referring to this. And so I wanted to pick this up. When I saw it, I was like, yes. So this is uh, 
by Joel Ackenbach, and it's from Simon and Schuster. Let me show you the cover here. And again, from Simon and Schuster out of New York, and it is a 2004 printing, I believe. So I may read you a little bit about this one. The back's covered with some pretty good, uh, you know, uh, blurbs. Got one from Walter Isaacs in here and several others. But um, let me read this cover to you. It says, uh, the war had been won. Now what? Always the question. Uh, this was the pressing political question for the United States in 1784 and a consuming one for George Washington. He had laid down his sword and returned home to Mount Vernon after eight and a half years as commander of the Continental Army. <clears throat> he had vowed that he had retired forever, that he would be a farmer on the bank of the Potomac River under his own vine and fig tree. But history was not done with him, and he was not done with history. Within a year, Joel Ackenbach uh, relates in this stunning narrative, Washington saddled up and rode away on one of the most daring journeys of his rich, adventurous life, a trek across the Appalachian Mountains to the frontier, where he would inspect his long-neglected western property and try to collect rent. The grand idea is the story of Washington's ambitions for the brand new republic that he had fought so hard to create. His western journey culminates in a breathtaking scheme. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, Washington, with the help of Thomas Jefferson, will transform the Potomac River into a commercial artery that will link the new west to the old east. Worried that the newborn country was so fragmented that it might literally split in two, into two separate and rival nations, he uses the, the skills he learned as a young backwoods surveyor to come up with his river, with his river plan. The future of the Union, Washington believes, depends on the Potomac route to the west, which will bind the country to one enterprise. Uh, Ackenbach's sympathetic and wry portrait of General Washington is not the stiff figure of official portraits, but that of a bold man who plunges into uncharted forests and sleeps in a downpour with only his cloak for shelter. He is an inventor, entrepreneur, and land speculator. He loves the West. His Washington is, this Washington is someone who understands that the fledging uh, Republic clinging to the Atlantic seaboard will become a great and booming nation. <coughs> Ackenbeck tracks Washington's river plan from the choosing of the site for the national cap the capital, which led to his being elected the, as the first president to its link decades after his death to various grandiose plans for a canal that would run hundreds of miles. Ultimately, the dream of a Potomac route to the west is abandoned and the nation splits, not east and west, but north and south. And the river becomes a legendary, oh, excuse me, the river becomes a boundary between warring sides in the Civil War. Like such classics as Undaunted Courage and Founding Brothers, Ackenbach's The Grand Idea is a large narrative of a great man and his grand plan that captures the uncertainties and conflicts of the new country, the passions of an ambitious people, and the seemingly endless beauty of the American landscape. And so I'm really looking forward to that. I think that's going to be interesting just to really build on that idea of the Potomac being the connection between East and West. And like I said, I just read about that in that Thomas Jefferson biography by um, uh, John Meacham that I'm buddy reading. And it's, it's funny, I made a comment on Voxer that um, when you... Every Washington biography that I have read is that the that the idea of connect, connecting east to west through the Potomac and you know building that canal system so that the Potomac was the east west route. Um, everything always says Washington. This was Washington's baby. It was his idea, and and it makes sense because you know the Potomac runs right beside his house. But um, in John Meacham's book, he he gave or it, to me it sounded like he gave credit for the idea to Thomas Jefferson, who put Washington in charge of it. So, kind of interesting how historians uh, interpret things. So, 
Anyway, the last book that I got for you, um, this one I was trying to think just right before I started the video, I was sitting there thinking, do I already have this? I, I might have already bought this in paperback. So, uh, but this is a hardback and really nice hardback copy. So I was very happy to have it, but this is um, The River of Doubt, Theodore Roosevelt's Darkest Journey by Candace Millard. And like I said, hardback copy always beats the paperback copy. So I'll just take the paperback copy to school and put it on, put it on the shelf for the kids if anybody's interested. This is from Doubleday, it's out of New York. And it is a 2005 uh, book. And so uh, let me show you the end pages here first. That's kind of neat. So late in Theodore Roosevelt's uh, life, um, just a few years before his death, really, um, he went on a journey to map out one of the tributaries to the Amazon, the River of Doubt. And... Uh, Let's see. Yeah, the River of Doubt was the was the tributary, and this ended up being a very dangerous, dangerous journey because uh, you got to remember the time period. Technology is not all that great, but um, they were out in the middle of nowhere with uh, you know really no way of calling for help. And Theodore Roosevelt ended up <coughs> coming down sick uh, from this journey, and some of the stuff that some of the some of the things that he catches is going to stay with him for the rest of his life. And uh, it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be the healthiest of uh, uh, journeys. So the back, back end pages were the same as the front. So let me, let me just read this to you real fast and then uh, we'll wrap this up. So let's see here. At once an incredible adventure narrative and a penetrating biographical portrait, The River of Doubt is the true story of Theodore Roosevelt's harrowing exploration of one of the most dangerous rivers on earth. So the River of Doubt, it is a black, uncharted river that snakes through one of the most treacherous jungles in the world. Indians armed with poison-tipped arrows haunt its shadows. Piranhas glide through its waters. Boulder-strewn rapids turn the river into a roiling cauldron. After his humiliating election defeat in 1912, Roosevelt set his sights on the most punishing physical challenge he could find, the first descent of an unmapped, rapids-choked tributary of the Amazon. Together with his son Kermit and Brazil's most famous explorer, Candido Mariano da Silva Rondon, forgive me if I butchered that name, <laughs> um, Roosevelt accomplished a feat so great that many at the time refused to believe it. In the process, he changed the map of the Western Hemisphere forever. Along the way, Roosevelt and his men faced an unbelievable series of hardships, losing their canoes and supplies to punishing whitewater rapids and enduring starvation, Indian attack, disease, drowning, and a murder within their own ranks. Three men died, and Roosevelt was uh, brought to the brink of suicide. The River of Doubt brings alive these extraordinary events in a powerful nonfiction narrative uh, thriller that happens to feature one of the most famous Americans who ever lived. From the soaring beauty of the Amazon rainforest to the darkest night of Theodore Roosevelt's life, here's Candace Millard's dazzling debut. And uh, here's your author. And what a debut it was. I'm... I, I always see this book come up, so I know it did well. Um, I'm real excited to read it. It's going to be, I think, a really good one. I enjoy. I really enjoy reading about Theodore Roosevelt. I think he is a very intriguing figure in American history. Not a perfect man, man by any means, but very intriguing. So, um, BookTube, uh, those were my new books from this weekend that I picked up. Uh, again, courtesy of my wife's sickness. <laughs> as I got my child out of the house so that she could get some rest. Now, with that being said, this is the good. Now, here's the bad. I did not get my 800 subs um, question answer video done. I meant to get, and it's probably gonna take two or three videos to get it done. And uh, I meant to do that on Sunday and did not get that done because I just ran out of time. I was taking care of things here at home, trying to help out my wife with some stuff. And, 
And uh, so later this week, that video is coming, I promise you. I have the questions right here. They're all printed out and uh, they're all ready to go. So I will get that filmed and I hope you enjoy it. Um, BookTube, I hope you've had a chance to uh, maybe get to the bookstore and get some new selections yourself. So um, get to reading them. That's, that's the important part. Get to reading them. So until next time, BookTube, thank you for watching. Happy reading.